Hello, everyone, and welcome to Surreal DB Stream number five. Today, we are here with Hugh and Toby, and they're going to be chatting about live queries with you all. But just as we start assembling ourselves, obviously, stick in the chat where you're watching in from. We've been having loads of great comments from people from all around the world for the last few streams. It's been a busy couple of weeks here at Surreal HQ. We've done quite a few new hires and announcements, which you'll have seen on LinkedIn if you're watching in from there, or Twitter if you're watching from there. And also, hello to everyone who's watching on YouTube and Discord. You might have also seen the biggest announcement in terms of our community and that we've reached 20,000 GitHub stars. So thank you all. We're doing a really big giveaway, which you might have seen on Twitter, which Farami has been leading our social media manager, who's also going to be moderating today. And it is to win um, some AirPods. So go and check it out. There's literally 24 hours left to enter that uh, great giveaway. Uh, hello to everyone who's joined us. Hello, Toby and Hugh. That's what we love to hear. I think we could probably get started. Toby. How are you? Uh, thank you, Lizzie. Um, excellent Just to see everyone here again, although I can't see any of you, so I don't know why I said that. Um, yeah, great great to have you here. Um, today's going to be a really interesting one. I know a lot of you are really excited to hear about what we're building with regards to live queries. Um, a lot of work being going on behind the scenes, uh, trying to make you know, make sure that this, uh, uh, this functionality scales um, and you know, handles queries properly and we'll, we'll, we'll delve in today. Um, I'll bring Hugh up in, in just a minute and we're gonna you know, delve into exactly what live queries are, um, what you can do with them, how it's different from um, other technologies and other platforms um, and other functionality in, in SurrealDB as well. And we'll be looking a little bit at, uh, at you know, the code that, that makes it work and, uh, and some of the trade-offs that you expect with, with this functionality. So Lizzie, thank you. And I'm going to bring you up onto the screen. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Welcome. Um, hi, everyone. Cool. Good to see you all. Um, yeah, should I just bring up the slides in that case? Uh, boop, boop, boop. Where are we? Here we are. Cool. So uh, the much anticipated feature, live queries. Um, yeah, let's jump into, let's jump into what they are. Um, some laughing in the building. But uh, yeah, so live queries, what are they? Um, so imagine that you've got this situation where you've got transactional data in your tables and um, you want updates to them. You want to see what changes are happening. So uh, what usually happens is you've got uh, a very complex pipeline um, of various different services and, and databases and um, like streaming systems. And you, you basically, uh, you have a complex problem um, and it takes a long while to, <laughs> to set up. Um, and so Toby's actually come up with this idea to actually uh, have a single statement that um, solves this problem for you. Um, you can just say live select start from table or um, whatever configurations of parameters you want for that. And you can just set up a stream to have your updates uh, happening in real time. So um, what are the exact properties behind this? Because uh, uh, it's very important to be uh, fully aware of exactly how it behaves um, and uh, under what conditions. So. The main three issues, uh, well, issues, the uh, kind of features really of uh, this functionality are that uh, live queries are ephemeral. What ephemeral means is that they are temporary. They you create them, and as soon as your uh, your program turns off or your connection is cancelled, then uh, the live query no longer exists. So that actually makes them very cheap. They're very uh, efficient to maintain because. Um, termination detection. As long as it's as long as detected, you don't need to maintain any, any state behind that. Um, so we've actually managed to reduce a whole load of overload because of uh, because of this ephemeral property. Like they're a cheap way of getting um, a stream of data. Um, a second very important feature of this is uh, that it's authorized uh, content. When you have a session that's uh, connected to your database. Um, you've got certain permissions. You can say you can you've got access to certain databases, namespaces, tables, and rows within the tables. Um, when you perform a live query, you can say you can say select star from uh, table, live select star from table, but you will only see the updates that you have permissions to do. And a very important detail about this is that 
this is also reflected in real time. So when your permissions change as the stream is happening, then that's also reflected on the data that is going down the stream. So this is actually quite a secure way of doing streaming um, while still keeping the, the low overhead properties of it all. Um, and third, uh, the third detail that's really important to remember is that they're filtered. Um, you can always say life select star from table, but uh, maybe you don't necessarily want all uh, all the updates that uh, you're interested. In. Maybe you only want the the ten, for example, most popular blog posts. You want the you know the upvotes that are happening to those blog posts or something, right? So you can actually filter your query based on the predicates, and you can select which fields are included um, in the return response as well. Um, That's um... Yes, sorry. Um, sorry, I was, was going to say that's, that's a great introduction, um, Hugh. And uh, I think there's going to be some questions on you know, how, how is this different from what you see in other databases, other data platforms. You know, you have uh, over the years, um, I think you know, starting about 2015, maybe a bit earlier with Firebase, you had kind of these real-time databases. Um, and, you know, and databases saying that they were real-time. RethinkDB was one of those. Um, but effectively, you didn't have this permissions layer sitting in in front or on top of the database itself and therefore effectively what that functionality was was very similar to change data capture or change data feeds which is another uh, piece of functionality uh, that we're building into SurrealDB as well um, albeit that's more of the traditional approach so I, I know Hugh's going to be touching on that a little bit later so um, I just want to say uh, before before Hugh com continues on uh, and what live queries are and how that's different from change data feeds. If you've got any other questions uh, from the community about uh, live queries, change data capture, I'm sure we'll be doing a stream in the future on change data capture um, itself. But yeah, if you've got any questions, uh, any questions on how to integrate with your favorite language, then, then please comment on YouTube, comment on LinkedIn, comment on Twitch uh, and Twitter, and uh, we'll answer as many questions as we can in this stream. Um, and uh, and Hugh, yeah, ca carry on, take it away. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as as uh, dig, kind of diving more deep into deeper into all these details, the um, the ephemeral property is extremely important for uh, for live queries. Um, as mentioned before, it's uh, it's designed to be. Um, have a very low performance overhead, so you can have, uh, uh, say, significantly more than what you'd normally have uh, in, in a regular system with the, the topics and partitions and having to split your, your streams in, in various different ways. We wanted that to be um, a very convenient way to access this uh, functionality. Um, so you, we, we want to provide the simple statements and, and it works just seamlessly behind the scenes. Uh, this ties in with our sharding and, and cluster capabilities very well. Um, so it's, uh, uh, it's very performant, but also um, doesn't actually put too much strain on the rest of the database, which is very important to us as well. Um, and um, another kind of aspect of this being uh, ephemeral is that you don't actually need tons of storage to retain the messages. When, when you have a, a streaming system and you expect to have a lot of traffic on the streaming system, you need to actually provision your storage so that you can ingest the data. So if you expect to have a terabyte of data, you need a terabyte of storage to handle that data. It doesn't matter if it's like a spike within the day or an entire month of, of data, you need to have that. But because this is ephemeral, then the data is garbage collected as, as soon as it's consumed. So um, as long as you are able to clean up the traffic on time as it's being ingested, which yeah, it happens within the system quite well, then um, you don't actually need massive hard drives backing this streaming capability. And the data within that is also shared. So um, that's, uh, that's taken care of as well to, to reduce the overhead on storage. Um, and Furthermore, because this is these are ephemeral, they're very easy to set up, and that means that you can restart them at any point. Um, so, if you start up your application and uh, you want to continue uh, a live stream, you you just re-execute the query, 
and you can continue where you left off from uh, quite conveniently. So that's an extremely important aspect um, from, from our design point. Yeah, so just uh, before we carry on there, Hugh, um, just want to answer one of these uh, questions from the community. So, Karim, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, the question is, let, you know, is it possible to subscribe to live queries from client libraries like Rust? Absolutely, and that's uh, that's kind of the main point of uh, of live queries in SerialDB. Um, you'll be able to subscribe to embedded databases, so changes over embedded databases, uh, changes in a distributed cluster or a single node instance, traditionally over WebSockets. Uh, potentially, we'll have uh, support for HTTP uh, server site sent events as well, albeit that's not gonna be immediate. Uh, it's definitely gonna be supported through our WebSocket first. Um, but what that will mean is it will be able to be consumed from JavaScript, Python, Rust, uh, Golang, um, effectively every language that can have a WebSocket connection uh, will be able to subscribe to the queries that they, um, they initiate, the live queries that they initiate with the database. Um, so yeah, great question. Uh, and absolutely, this is designed to be very flexible. It's designed to be authenticated from the client. Um, and you can query it from any language that you use for your development. Um, cool. I'll move on to the next slide. Um, so we've covered ephemeral. Yeah. So um, we mentioned earlier that the data is authorized and that some various different products on the market, they don't necessarily offer this capability. Um, this is actually very uh, important because we, this is a very multi-tenanted uh, system. We've got namespaces, we've got databases. We do want people to have uh, granular access, both on row level storage, table storage, and, and beyond that. Um, and because of this multi-tenancy, multi then the permissions that uh, surround that, they, they can change quite, uh, quite significantly. For example, if you're designing an application and say you say that you're writing uh, content, blog posts, news articles or something, you've got an edit button, you can publish something, unpublish it. You've just changed the permissions on this article as, as you're working through it. And that needs to be reflected in the entire system. You can't have somebody who's subscribed to a stream see it and then you know not have the interface adapt to it right you need to have this stream and subsequent streams that restart from a future point need to see these updates as well so um the authorization aspect of of this functionality is is uh, we're very familiar with <laughs> the nuance that people want to uh, design around this um and this is actually tied in with the existing uh, system of permissions. So if you've seen, for example, that you can define row-based uh, authorization um, to subsets of the database, this this doesn't need any modifications beyond that. You, If you've already configured that uh, for your database, then you can use live queries and it's already tied in with that uh, capability. Um, and just looking at the slides. Uh, yeah, it's it's real time. Um, so any any change that happens within a uh, a single like, timestamp within the database, uh, all the transactions that are at that timestamp will have a coherent, consistent view. Uh, anything plus one step beyond that timestamp will be no longer valid. It'll be uh, it's very consistent. Like not asynchronous updates. These are synchronous updates to to clarify. Um, and the third aspect was that it's filtered. Um, this is based on the scope of the update, but as uh, uh, alongside that, also the predicates. So you'd reduce the scope to um, reduce the bandwidth that you're taking up uh, for your updates. Say that you've got you know a thousand updates a second. You can have you know eight columns of a thousand updates. So you can have just two uh, well records, two records of your a thousand updates, right? So the filtering is um, one aspect that we've we've introduced. Um, but alongside that, you've also got the predicates. You can subscribe to table updates. You might have permission to see all of them, but you don't want to see uh, necessarily every single one. Say that you've got you know, a million rows. Uh, you only want the top uh, top ranked uh, data, the top ranked posts, or the ones that are most recent. Um, you can do a filter on, on these posts to reduce the amount of bandwidth that is being consumed um, for these, these updates. Um, and furthermore, you don't actually need to do any configuration for this. Um, you, this is all part of the query, um, just a single one-line serial QL statement, and uh, it, it works out of the box. Hugh, 
you. I, um, we've got a question from the community here about, um, you know, how do you get notified when a record is updated in a live query in SurrealDB, which is a great question. So um, um, I'm sure you've got some slides coming, you know, coming to, to talk about that in a little bit. But let's, uh, let's talk about kind of how you actually create that live query. Um, you've just shown you know, actually writing the SQL code, but how do you actually get uh, the responses back from the database, uh, either in an embedded context um, and you know over the over the net, as it were? How how does this actually? Uh, let's discuss a little bit about how that actually comes back and how that um, that change, any change in the database, is is presented to the user. Yeah, um, so I do I do have a demo and some slides later on that uh, go into these details and. and well, in, in better in better detail, um, but uh, as a general idea, you'd execute the live query, and as a response from the live query, you get a live query ID, uh, which you can keep track of to both filter the updates as well as uh, terminate the the subscription. Um, but aside from that, your database interface has a stream or a channel that it can access where it will read all the live query notifications that are relevant for that session only. Um, so if you've got, um, for example, multiple um, sessions connected to a SurrealDB instance, um, if, even though the SurrealDB instance is shared, your connection, your session, only receives the um, updates that are relevant to itself. Um, so it's already filtered at that level. But the idea is that you've got um, the life statement that gets executed as a subscription, you get the ID. And as a separate uh, concept, you've got a, a channel that you can access to read the notifications from. Um, and that is um, at most once messaging. It's non-replayable. And so you'll have like a, a general consumer on top of it that uh, tracks and filters and maps um, the ingested data. Yeah, Shuvadi. Um Interesting point that, that Hugh just made. Uh, you know, you, sh you should be able to receive a channel or a WebSocket uh, connection with the updates. Uh, of you know the changed data in the database. Uh, interestingly, the, the channel, albeit it is consumable uh, through the Rust API, um, it's probably going to be um, each live query will probably have its own channel set up through our own API. We haven't actually built that bit yet, just yet. But um, if you're consuming the, the Rust API and not the the raw database itself, then you'll actually get a, a channel for each uh, live query that you create on the server side or if you're dealing with javascript um or you know python or golang or anything else which is using a websocket connection you're going to get uh, a stream of updates down your websocket connection for all of the queries that you have subscribed to um, and then you are able to or the library itself will filter out um, the queries depending on you know it'll, it'll group them and, and send it down the right uh, internal structure for each live query internally into the, the client SDK, if that makes sense. But yeah, great question. Um, and I'll let, I'll let Hugh carry on from here. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, so these live queries, uh, we've described the, the properties that we designed for. Um, however, designing with these properties, it does have limitations um, that are associated with them. So it's very important to realize that these, this, that live queries are not change data capture. We, um, the change data capture has the, it's very consistent because it needs to be a, a replayable state of the database um, and it needs to be consistent across all partitions, shards, um, ranges, and so on. And it tends not to be filtered based on, on predicates. It tends to be like a total system view. And considering that it's a total system view, it's not um, centered around authorization. So. Um, the, the live queries are quite the opposite of change data capture. Um, another thing to highlight is that because this is such a convenient feature to use, there is the risk that it might be misused as a messaging channel. It can be used as a messaging channel. We, uh, we want to discourage that, like it, it will certainly work. Um, but it's, it's important to remember that this does incur overhead uh, because we are now tracking um, all the live queries per table, whether it's authorized, uh, whether it's in a cluster and we're needing to terminate it. So there's garbage collection. There are a lot of steps that need to be um, maintained and you would you could use it. Uh, you could just use direct messaging with TCP instead of, of message uh, messaging via the live queries, um, but it's possible to do that. Um, another issue is that it's, 
the perfect ordering of events. Um, the events are consistent. Any um, any events that you read, um, because they would have gone through um, the transactional system that we have, the they are they are it's correct data. It's a consistent view, even though there are two writes to the same location. If you receive uh, an update for one, that means that at that point in time, that was the correct data and the latest data. If you receive that notification, so. If you do receive some changes in the events, then they won't be conflicting logically. Um, so it's it's consistent data, but it's they, you might see some variance in in ordering in a in a distributed setting in a single node setting. The the ordering is consistent across all streams. Um, and then it's um, the final aspect is that it's non restartable because these are ephemeral instances, and we do rely quite heavily on these properties. Um, then you can't actually restart the instance. Um, the failure detection and garbage collection are associated with um, making sure that once something's terminated, we know that it's terminated and we can get rid of it and reduce the, the search space. So uh, it's very important for us to actually uh, maintain that live cruise on non-restartable. Um, whereas change data capture, that would be something that you'd configure on top of a database to, to record things system-wide. Um, so it's, it's important to keep those properties in mind, I think. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. I just want to reiterate that um, you know there there is a, a big difference between change data capture um, in this database when we have that functionality, but also in any other database out there on the market. Change data capture is about being able to restart at a particular point in time and seeing all of the changes to the database or to a table since that point in time. Um, and with live queries, as Hugh has said, but just to reiterate, you know the data and the stream of, of changes that happen on, on a particular table or whatever you're subscribed to will only uh, come down to your, to your client whilst that live query connection is open. The moment that live query connection stops and you restart it again, it'll carry on from, from that point that you restart it. So in between when that connection is lost um, or you know with the ability to go back in time, you don't have that functionality with live queries. Um, if a connection does get disconnected, and you want to restart that live query, what you would do is you would get the the data as it looks like at that new point in time, and then continue the live query on from that. So it's really designed for uh, real time uh, changes of data, um, as opposed to historical access of the changes in data over time. Yeah, exactly. Um, cool. Uh, so I think we can kind of talk about some of the nuance around this that we've just uh, discussed a bit in the in the limitations. Um, for example, with the ordering. Um, so in this in this diagram, we've got client A, client B, and client C. Um, client B and C they're actually separate threads sharing the same driver on a single uh, on a single node. Uh, client A, on the other hand, is a separate node that's interacting with the serial DB cluster. Um, They've all got live uh, live queries against the database. Um, it's all against the same table. Um, in the first one, we're selecting ID and title. Um, in the second one, we've got uh, ID, rank, and link. Um, and in the third one, we've got select everything, but we're limiting uh, with predicate to have rankings above 50. Um, so what will happen in all of these is that the registration will, uh, the serial DB uh, instances will register that these live queries are being executed, and updates that happen across the cluster will be registered with uh, with all three of these live queries because they're associated with the same table. Um, however, we do reduce the um, amount of overhead. Um, if the live query is happening on the same node, if the updates are happening on the same node, we don't need to notify ourselves of this, right? So we're, we're reducing the amount of communication that happens in coordination. Um, however, because of that uh, reduction in, in overhead, then the ordering might uh, vary slightly because transactions that conflict, um, they they back each other off, right? They, one needs to be restarted or the other, or there's a wait before one gets completed. But if there are separate writes, then Technically speaking, you can broadcast one live query update while the other one is persisted at the exact same time. Um, so you won't actually uh, see these. Um, you won't see these issues uh, in in any environment. The because of the transactional guarantees, then everything will be logically correct. But um, 
client B and client C will see the same updates in the same order. Client A might see a slightly different order, but the same correct updates um, to understand that behavior. Um, but otherwise, yeah, all these all these queries uh, would uh, um, would be correct. Um, sorry, yeah. Uh, perhaps I'll quickly do uh, a little demo of what that looks like in our terminal. It's still not quite uh, production ready. We need to actually get the um, the client facing library interfaces um, ready to to be able to handle this. And we've already got. Well, Toby's nearly got the, the web sockets interface ready. Was going it just uh, just before we got on stream. So I'll quickly share uh, what this looks like. Um, how do I... okay, so While Hugh's bringing that up, um, I think something to, something to uh, to mention is um, you don't actually have to subscribe to the entire record in SerialDB. Um, so you could actually say, look, I just want to receive just this field or just these you know these three fields, and you know. When that record, when that uh, document changes, um, and one of those three record, uh, three, three fields change, then then I will get a notification. But if the record is updated, but those three fields don't change, then I won't actually get a notification at all. Um, in addition to that, you don't have to subscribe to the entire record uh, or even those three fields. What you can do, you can you can subscribe to the changes in the record. So you could say, you know, live select diff from. Uh, this this table, and then when you are able to uh, you know, to see records that have changed, instead of receiving the full record, you're actually only seeing the changes, which is a a, a diff patch, a diff match patch uh, representation of the data that's changed. Um, so, yeah, here's here's Hugh bringing that data up. Right. Before we before we jump into uh, Hugh's terminal here, uh, I'm going to bring up a question about authentication. Um, so Jay has asked, you know, can you show a JWT payload that auths only some fields with a live query? And, there, and therefore, if the query has more fields projected than auth, does the query succeed but remove the non-authed fields or does the whole query fail? So this is really an interesting point that coincidentally came up in our engineering chat this morning. Um, and that is, you know, if you're querying the user table, but the authentication permissions only dictate that you can see one record in that table. That query shouldn't fail as a whole. It should only show you one record that you can see. Um, so in the, sense, in the same sense, in live queries, if you can uh, only see, let's say, records, um, orders maybe that belong to your account, um, and you, you, you know, request to see all changes to all of the orders in the table, then you will only be sent the orders that match your authentication permission. So they match your um, your account ID or maybe something else uh, in, in the permissions filter that enables you to see that or and not see other, other records. So um, absolutely, it, it removes the non-authenticated fields. Uh, it does not fail the whole query as a whole. Um, and it only allows you to see the data that you're allowed to see. So it's uh, completely secure in that regard. You can't, you don't, don't get sent notifications of other people's data or anything like that. You can't subscribe to other people's data, even if you try to query a table which you don't have access to. Um, and on that note, we've got some, we've got some improved kind of security uh, features uh, coming to SerialDB, which will improve how you as a developer can configure your database to prevent um, users using up uh, resources and bandwidth. Um, for queries that they don't have permission to run. Uh, so that's coming in the future. Um, for the moment, I will let you jump into the world of Hughes Terminal. Thanks, Toby. Um, yeah, so um, we've got the server started up in, in trace mode. The reason we started up in trace mode is because uh, we are receiving the notifications, um, but we're not actually publishing them down uh, a web socket at the moment. So we start the client over here. Uh, which is connecting to the database. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to put some queries over here. Um, so we're going to uh, create a live query uh, against uh, the person table uh, from person. Um, and on the server side, we can see that it's registered and we're receiving the same uh, live query ID um, as we've got, uh, I know that's the web sockets, right? But we've got a, a live query ID over here that we can use to um, manage the 
the session uh, of the live query. So we can kill it or we can monitor it or uh, do anything if we want with it, right? Um, so now that we've got that created over here, we can uh, just uh, set the number. Sorry, just for this one sec. <laughs> um, yeah, set the number because uh, I need to copy this. Um, blah, 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 blah. So if we create some data over here, um, what would actually happen in reality is on the client side, uh, sorry, I'm, okay, yeah, sorry, on the client side, um, we uh, we would receive our, our stream where we've got the updates coming in and we'd consume from that, but it's not yet being sent to this uh, client side, so we're having to rely on the logs in on the server side to, uh, to demonstrate that this works. Um, so we can see that we've got a notification that it's uh, registered for this query. If we register another query, uh, so let's start from person, we've got another live query ID over here. So we can now create um, Toby yet again. Uh, well, yet again. <laughs> One sec. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Like this. Um, let's grab this. Uh, we can paste that in over here. And so um, we've got two notifications being sent. Um, so the, the database is registering that a change has happened and it will publish, well, to the same client hypothetically, but it's two, two separate streams in case there are uh, different filters on these streams. Um, and so let's do an update over here um, for the same person table. Um, and again, it's it's going to both streams. Both streams are interested in the changes to the person table, um, but the, this time around, the the change type, uh, yeah, the change type is is update instead of create. And we also support delete, and we'll have various diff patches and and so on. But uh, that's more or less how it would work. Um, and switching back uh, out of the terminal and into my screen where I've got a code sample. One sec, boop, 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 boop. window. Uh, screen. So this is more or less what it would look like. This this absolutely isn't isn't client side code, but you can see on line one twenty three, um, we've got the, the the database interface. This would hypothetically be a driver. You'd get the um, notifications channel, and then you'd uh, receive events from it. So it's like a shared channel of live query updates for everything that's registered to to that single connection. Um, and then you'd have to consume from that, which um, that that covers all all the content that I really wanted to discuss. So I guess we can uh, move over to uh, Q and A now. You brilliant. I mean, so what you saw there was just a, a kind of brief overview of how WebSockets work. Uh, sorry, not WebSockets, live queries work. Um, that was actually running over our WebSocket interface um, from our SQL, you know, command line SQL. Uh, tool, um, but these will be able to be queried directly against the WebSocket interface, whether that's from Golang, Java, uh, JavaScript itself. We've got a question from the community on both uh, Kotlin uh, and WebAssembly, so I'll, uh, I'm going to let Hugh answer the Kotlin one because Hugh's managing our Java implementation, uh, so that's probably quite relevant for that. So yeah, Hugh. Yeah, um, so Kotlin is obviously a, a very important language because that's the language that backs uh, a lot of Android development that's happening. Um, so we can definitely have Kotlin bindings. We've had somebody from the community actually write to us directly um, saying that, first of all, they've got this interface and that they'd like to contribute it. So we're in discussions with this person about uh, bringing that forwards. Um, in terms of capabilities, like we're thinking that we'd much prefer having a uh, a stable Java core that can be spread across Scala, Kotlin, Clojure, and any other JVM uh, languages. Um, but there's there's no reason why we couldn't have uh, a Kotlin specific implementation if there are uh, reasons for doing so. Yeah. Toby, you're just realized I'm on mute. Um, yeah, ju just following on from what Hugh said there, um, you know, Java is one of our, our um, 
our uh, supported libraries um, and that group of libraries is increasing uh, all the time uh, we're working uh, heavily on our rust implementation which will be then used to build WebAssembly. and again there's a, there's a question here which i'll answer just now um, but before i do that 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 rust implementation will also be used to build out our c implementation which can then be used to build out uh, erlang and ruby and and other libraries that can depend on c uh, regarding java itself um, we do want to to improve this connection this this client library uh in you know increasing the areas where it can be used um i'm not a java expert myself but you know hugh mentioned uh, jvm and and kotlin and uh you know the ability to to use this on uh, client devices as well like mobile devices as well as from server side is really important to us going forward so we're not there just yet but um we're definitely um definitely got some big plans for java and the ecosystem surrounding that with regards to WebAssembly. Um, you may have seen uh, recently that there's a big pull request uh, merged just recently, I think just yesterday, uh, from Rushmore. So this is now the first step to making our WebAssembly instance use the un the new underlying Rust API that was launched in version nine uh, or beta nine. Um, the WebAssembly instance will be able to be loaded like a JavaScript uh, plugin, um, so a JavaScript library. So you'll be able to query load the the WebAssembly plugin and then make queries either locally so embedded on top of in, in memory or on top of index db or you'd be able to connect over the network with http or web sockets to a remote um, instance of surreal db running in the server or running in a distributed setup um, so it doesn't listen on a port um, it's purely running inside the browser um, and you can connect to it in the same way that you might do with local storage or index DB. Um, you create your instance like you would do in JavaScript, um, but the difference is it's the entire database is running in WebAssembly in the browser if you want to, or it's connecting remotely over WebSockets and HTTP. Um, so the, the difference to our WebAssembly library compared to our JavaScript library is that in WebAssembly, it'll be using our binary protocol in Rust, which means um, You'll be able to do more uh, more complicated things regarding uh, data and how that data is converted to JavaScript. Uh, and in addition, it enables you to run the database entirely in the browser for embedded use cases. Maybe that's for um, offline querying of applications, um, or maybe you know w building other applications entirely in the browser which don't interact with a server at all. So we've got some big plans there for our libraries and WebAssembly. Uh, we're hoping to to release that along with our beta beta ten coming soon. Here's another question. So, uh, so I'll let Hugh answer this. What are the implications with regards to data consistency in a distributed setup? Um, it, a good question here. I'm not sure if this uh, is directly um, regarding live queries or data generally. So I'll, I'll let Hugh answer it in both. Um, I think importantly, SurrealDB is designed to be a database that can be easily used by a developer. We didn't want the developer to have to understand transactions or understand consistency models. Uh, and they also, you know, we need a developer wants to know that the data that they enter in a transaction exists and it's persisted and it's consistent. And when they retrieve that data back, it exists. So I'll, I'll let Hugh go into the, uh, the more of a technical aspect on that uh, and talk about data consistency generally and in live queries itself. Yeah, so, uh, so a big selling point of SurrealDB is that it's ACID compliant. That means it's strongly consistent across the entire uh, feature set. And we don't want to, we don't want to relax those constraints under, under any circumstances. We don't want asynchronous communication. Uh, we want uh, communication that is reliable, even if the messaging is faulty. So we've actually gone through several iterations of redesign uh, of live queries, thinking about how we can maintain these properties. Um, and the end result that we have is um, basically coordination via the state on the transaction storage layer on Thai KV. Um, because we're communicating in that way, then we've got the serializability guarantees uh, from Thai KV, meaning that any uh, conflicting writes, any conflicting updates, um, either they are um, you know, queued um, before one transaction completes, or the, if it's a conflict that can't be resolved, then one of them is uh, having to be retried. Um, due to the way that this is designed, this actually 
reduces the, the footprint of conflict as well. Um, we've been very mindful of the fact that uh, we don't want uh, conflicting transactions as uh, you're ingesting a large amount of data. So we've, a, we've been able to design a system that is both has strong um, asset guarantees, consistent um, uh, views across the entire system, uh, irre uh, irrespective of which part of the cluster you're on or which uh, part of the data set you're looking at, um, permissions and tables, shards, and so on. Um, but also, um, sorry, I was going to say that it's it, yeah, it's, it's basically it's correct. It's co it's a correct model um, that is consistent across the entire storage lab. Um, and there was a minor minor bit over there also about embedded. Yes, yeah, so this will this will work for embedded connecting remotely as well as server side and and so on. Any configuration. Excellent. Yeah, great question there. And uh, just reiterating Hugh's points, you know, this, uh, I think that the days of, of databases which don't offer consistency or don't offer transactions over multiple records or multiple tables, um, I suppose they're not gone. They, they have their, their uses, um, usually around performance. With CerulearDB, we want to, to go towards the performance side as well. That's really important. But to offer the guarantees that a developer building an application in today's you know today's day and age expects from that database um thank you andy great comment there um we've got some big things planned for surreal um and yeah we've got some we've got some you know big things planned which we haven't launched yet and we haven't announced uh but also we're, we're definitely working on performance uh got some big performance prs that have just recently been merged uh by finn um and and some some more performance th uh, things coming soon. In, in addition to indexing, which we'll be having a stream on uh, in a couple of weeks' time, I believe. Um, in the meantime, yeah. So let's jump into a, another question here. Um, let me see. Let me see. When can we expect um, when can we expect live queries to stream to show up in the beta client libraries? Um, so. The live queries themselves and uh, the functionality inside the Rust client library will be coming for beta 10, so uh, not soon, not not long, not long now. Um, for JavaScript, GoLang um, as well. So so WebAssembly, JavaScript, and GoLang. Um, that implementation will be um, at the same point, so uh, ready for for the launch of beta ten. Um, Java potentially, we'll have to see about that, but but it won't be long afterwards if if it's not launched immediately with it. Um, and then we'll look to get that functionality in uh, in Python, maybe not immediately, but in in due course and very soon after that. Um, so the intention is to have all of this functionality available very soon. Um, it will be it will be scalable. It'll be consistent. It'll be uh, as performant as it can be with with such a uh, piece of functionality that's dependent on permissions and filtering and everything like that. Um, but it will give you developers the ability to uh, build your apps against it and have that real time uh, functionality when building directly against RealDB. Um, Yeah, so here's a, here's a interesting question, not especially regarding um, live queries, um, but backend storage engines, which is interesting, um, and that's exactly right, Jay. So um, at the moment, storage engines need to support uh, transactions; they need to support multi-key uh, updates and uh, reads and writes in the in the transactions. Um, whether that's in a distributed setting or an uh, embedded setting. Um, there are lots of other data stores that, you know, some have been suggested to us that, uh, you know, operate in a, in a distributed way, but they don't have that, that guarantee with regards to transactions. Um, and it's very hard to build something like SerialDB on top of those um, because, especially when you're working with graphs or anything which edits or alters, multiple records at one time so for instance when you create a graph relation between two nodes what you're effectively doing is you're creating a third node so that's one right and you're creating four links out to the node out to the other node and then in twice you're creating five um, records on the key value store just for that one graph edge and because of that if you have a, um, a storage engine which can't um, guarantee that all of those rights will be either succeed or fail as a whole um, 
in a transaction, then you can't build consistently a database like SerialDB on top of them. So uh, we do have some plans for other storage uh, backends, um, Rust-based ourselves, uh, but also, um, you know, we have we have big plans to build our own distributed key-value store over the next uh, you know year or two um, with certain characteristics that we. Uh, want and need to see in SerialDB that enable some other functionality that you can't yet uh, do in the database. So we've got some big plans to improve the storage engine support that we uh, that we currently offer, um, both from a compilation point of view, but also a functionality point of view. Uh, Hugh, do you have anything to, to add to that? I pretty much covered it, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's... Uh, we've we've got we've got a lot of ambitious plans for for where we're taking the the clustering capabilities. Like we've got um, uh, quite uh, uh, re really interesting ideas on on where we can take this these capabilities. And um, yeah, we're designing everything with with kind of the future um, in mind for for that. So excellent. Yeah, we've got a great uh, another question here from Paul. Um... How would you compare the performance of SerialDB with other SQL solutions like Postgres? And uh, I think this is a really great question. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, SerialDB is a document database. That's how it stores its data. So it's storing all of the metadata for the fields along with every single record. That gives you great flexibility. Um, and it enables you to do embedded objects, embedded arrays, and it enables you to also link out to other records efficiently within those uh, or that embedded data. Um, when you compare it to a column-based database, uh, such as you know, an analytics database like DuckDB or ClickHouse, or if you compare it to a relational database like uh, Postgres or MySQL, those are, are never storing that metadata along with the record itself. So for instance, in, in uh, Postgres, you're going to have uh, four columns, let's say, um, and those columns have a specific type, and the data in those columns is stored just as the data there's they're not storing the type or the field along with that information um, and because of that it's very performant um, but it doesn't give you that flexibility that you would have with a with a document database um, that said um, where we want to really be to sit is we want it to be very performant in terms of you know being up there with other document databases uh, we've got um, a big uh, amount of work being done at the moment on indexing uh, other work being done on uh, performance with regards to numbers and typing. So we've got uh, some big changes coming uh, very soon to uh, numbers in SerialDB and the ability to use different uh, types of numbers. So int 8, 16, 32, 64, and 128 bit numbers. Um, so uh, we've also got you know, plans to change decimals so that it supports arbitrary length decimals, but without having a, a performance sacrifice for that. Um, and in addition to that, we've got other improvements within the Rust code itself that will that will increase the speed. Um, so, yeah, definitely got some. You know, we've got some big intentions for SerialDB to have that performance, whether it's embedded, whether it's distributed in a in a, in a cluster. Obviously, how you run SerialDB uh, determines the limitations and the performance guarantees that you can expect. Um, I'll let Hugh jump into a little bit about the kind of performance around distributed and uh, and how that relates. But you know. Uh, I think if you if you watched the stream last uh, a couple of weeks ago regarding uh, complex record IDs, you can see uh, you know as a developer the choices that you make around the data and the record IDs that you use also affects performance. So as a developer, you can choose the performance guarantees that you want depending on whether you're doing graph or time series or uh, CRUD or random writes or random reads. Um, so so really we definitely gives you the flexibility to have that performance. But Hugh, I'll let you talk about distributed uh, just briefly. Yeah, totally. I mean, um, performance in general is is a very complex topic because it's very tied to the specific applications that that you want to use, um, the the nature with which you're querying the data, how much data is um, involved in the queries in terms of locks and uh, and the the read space, um, and which parts are, are paralyzed and so on. It's it's very difficult to establish a benchmark, even if it is like for like. Um, it's because 
because of how it scales. Like ultimately, the underlying storage that Postgres has is uh, somewhat different from the underlying storage that we have, and we believe that the storage that we have uh, is better aligned with with both big data um, and both with sharding and partitioning. Um, so we are very much aligned with uh, kind of the the big picture of how this will scale and making sure that. Um, not only is it um, performant at scale, but also seamless to scale. We we want people to be able to very easily ramp up um, the cluster sizes that they have um, with uh, low cost in terms of having to rethink indexes or rethink queries or having to rerun query plans. We we don't want that to be um, an obstacle when, when people are designing their applications. Excellent, excellent. So I'm just going to answer one very short question and then uh, well, actually I'll answer two short questions. Um, so the first one is, uh, you know, how scalable is Cerulean com com you know, compared to other uh, NoSQL databases? And I think uh, Hugh just answered that um, in, a, in a kind of roundabout way. Effectively, CerulDB is designed to scale to the, the needs of the developer, the needs of the application builder, um, you know, uh, with a with a distributed storage engine and with the separation of the query layer with the storage or the compute layer with the storage layer, um, with CerulDB you can scale that storage layer to really as as large as you need uh, terabytes or even petabytes of data. So, um, you know there are obviously trade offs regard you know, regarding that. If you store all of your data on a single node, then you have much better performance that compared to if you're storing it over hundreds of nodes in a distributed setup. But vice versa, you also have limits on how many queries you can you know, process at one time, how many reads, how many writes at the same time, and how much data you can store as a whole. So um, as with any piece of technology, there are trade-offs to, to how you run it. Um, but really, CerulDB is designed to be scalable, and that's really the exact reason why we separated out the storage layer from the compute layer and the query layer. And I think also uh, relating this a little bit to uh, live queries, uh, the intention is to keep that stateless so that we can run those those live queries uh, over any storage engine regardless of of how it's implemented whether it's embedded or distributed um, and then finally the one question which i know a lot of uh, people in our community are, are wanting to hear which is is only ta on the surreal cloud i've been on the wait list a long time was zej thank you great question i'm not going to answer it now i'm sorry i'm sorry apologies for that but keep on the lookout this week uh, for um, an announcement. That's all I'm going to say. So yeah, um, Hugh, thanks so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your detailed uh, dive into the world of live queries. Um, and for everyone who's listened, thank you for joining us. Um, and you'll you'll be seeing this functionality in uh, the next beta release and in the client libraries uh, very soon. So so thank you for joining us and look forward to uh, to seeing you all online soon. Thanks everyone, have a good one, bye.